I'll post that today. Um, yeah, I have my computer, so I could do that. All right, other questions? So the, uh, the qualitative analysis report will be due on Tuesday or next week. Okay. But we're still ha we're having our test on Thursday, Chapter 16. Oh, crap. <laughs> All right. Uh, is that it? Uh-huh. Exact what? Guideline. Guideline for the lab report. Well, the lab report is going to be very simple. You don't have to write much as far as um, the last lab report that you did. And so you're just going to turn in a sheet, you know, with your name. And then this is going to be, you know, unknown, num whatever, number. And then just the ions that, that you found. Cations here. And then if you did the anions, you'd have a different unknown number uh, for the anion. And so let's say I found sodium ions and uh, iron, et cetera. Just a list of the ions that you found here. And then um, how many ions do you have all together? Ten. Ten of the cations, right? Yeah. And so if we do the cations in basically we're, we're looking at all the steps for the cations. So for example, um, sodium ions, you would write the observations and equations associated with the determination of sodium ions. Hmm? Then ammonium ions, and then silver ions. Etc. And so all observations slash equations. The observations, I had a question yesterday. The observations are just the observations I wrote on the end. Because the observations that you have for your known are, aren't as clean because you have mixture stuff in there. And so this is what it should or is supposed to look like. Some people say, well, if there's no reaction, do I have to write that down? Yeah, actually, no reactions are important because that's how we separate things. You know, if everything had a reaction, then uh, we're not going to be able to separate anything from anything, right? Yeah. And so we, we need to know when certain things react and when they don't react in order to figure out the, the whole um, qualitative analysis path. Uh -huh. So we don't write our... You don't write your observations and equations. We, all I want you to do is this. Um, the observations and equations I, I wrote on the board just copy those down on the sheets of paper and turn those in. Okay. This will be for the cations and then the anions. So, the, anions. the observations and equations for the anions. This should be simple. I mean, everybody should be able to get 100% on this. This part, everybody should be able to get 100%. Everybody should, but that doesn't happen. There are lots of people who, who, who get very few points on this part because they don't write anything down. But this part here, um, you know, if you miss an ion or you get an extra ion, then you're going to lose some points. So, uh huh. Yeah, handwritten. You don't have to type, right? Uh huh. It is mentioned ion or or an extra ion. So you're going to be checking our unknown. If you, uh, okay, what was the last part? I'll be checking your unknown. Is that? Well, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna look at the um, key and then see. You know, did you get the the ions or not that were in your unknown? Uh oh. This is, you know, this second part here is just to spread out the points because if I put all the points in here, you, usually what happens if one person misses an ion and drops you a grade or two grades, you know, uh, because so. So this isn't going to be, I mean, this is going to be weighted pretty heavily in, in this uh, to distribute the points out. All right, uh, 
Anything else? No? I want to talk about um, today's lab and Thursday's lab. Uh, Thursday, we don't have enough time for discussion. We're just going to go and start the lab. That way, uh, we have time for the test. Um, today's lab is the Le Chalier's. Yes. And so let's look at the reactions here. <coughs> What's the first equilibrium that you're going to look at? Copper two. Copper two. Oh yeah, copper two. Uh, yeah, tetra aqua. Aqua, sorry. All right, uh, this turns out to be a light blue color. And so a lot of these we can just visually see um, which way the equilibrium shifts by just looking at the color difference. Because uh, it turns out aquas aren't the, the best ligands. Am amines are better here. And so the amines can easily displace the aquas. And so an aqua gets broken off, an amine replaces it. Eventually all four aquas are replaced. It doesn't happen all at once. This is like a four-step process. Right. Actually, many-step process. But we'll just, you know, the end result is all the aquas have been replaced. Uh, this is a deep blue color. And so this one is easy to shift to the right. Uh, you shift this to the right by just adding ammonia, right? But how do you? How would you shift it to the left? You know, how can you get rid of Ammonia. Because if we increase the ammonia concentration, we shift it right. If we decrease the ammonia concentration, we can shift it left. And so, how can you decrease the ammonia concentration? Yeah. Uh, acid. John, add acid. Yeah, exactly. You would add acid. Ammonia is a base. You can attack it. Ammonium is not a good ligand. You know, because you know, ammonium is actually a very um, not even a ligand because ammonia. Does it have any lone pairs? It can, there's no lone pairs on ammonium. And so we'll destroy the ammonia versus amines. You know, amines would retain the lone pair so it could still act as a ligand. You know. But the ammonium ions won't. And so we add acid and uh, shift this. So this is very easy to see. Let's stop plate. Okay, is that it for that? That's the nickel one too. Okay, uh, is that the next one, nickel? Yeah, same, same procedure with nickel. Same. Yeah, we'll, uh, same thing. Okay, same thing with nickel. Yeah. yeah. We're forming an amine complex. Yeah. Yeah. Can be yeah, and the colors are different for nickel, depending on if it's aqua or amine. And that, that actually turns out to be the case for a, a lot of these complexes. Uh, you can change the color by using a different ligand. Oxalato? Yeah. Okay. For, for nickel or for copper? Copper. Copper? The oxalato complex will be, I don't know what color that's going to be. It's probably going to be, you know, when we get into chapter 24, part 2, we can kind of guess what the color is going to be based on, actually, we can pretty much estimate what the color is going to be. Because, um, You know, if we have a deep blue color here with a mean, you know, with an oxalato, it does something to the electron energy, the orbitals, and um, it'd probably be in this range here, you know, green, blue, maybe not yellow, you know, yellow would probably, the aqua complex of copper choose more yellow. In fact, uh, the chloro complex of copper two is very yellow. But that that will, that will come later when we go into um, orbitals and that kind of stuff.
All right, so the nickel, uh, you can write the equation. The equation's given there for you. Yeah. All right, what's next after nickel? Cobalt. Cobalt? Yeah. Okay. What are you doing with cobalt? Okay, so are you, you're, you're going to form a chloro complex of cobalt? Yes, sir. Tetrachloro. Tetrachloro, okay, so what is it originally? Hexa uh, aqua. Hexa aqua. Hexa aqua. Tetrachloro? Yeah. And that one's only got a two minus charge. Is this how they write it? Uh, yeah, plus six waters. All right. So this is easy to shift to, to the right, but how, how could you shift this to the left? You know, I just add more HCl, or you know, increase the concentration. Of HCl should shift it right. Do you have to shift shift this one to the left, or you just shift it to the right only? Okay. All right. All right. So we're just going to dilute it down to shift it left. Solution dilution. Dilution is going to have a greater impact on this because the chloride concentration dependence is to the fourth power. And so if you cut the concentration in half, that's one half to the fourth power, which means, yeah, versus this concentration is to the first power, this concentration is to the first power, so dilution should work here because it's going to have a greater impact on the chloride concentration than the other concentrations. All right. So we'll just dilute it with water and shift it the other way. Is that it? Okay, then what's next? Silver carbonate. Silver carbonate? Sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate and silver nitrate. Yeah, Okay. Uh, what does that form? Okay, so if we're taking silver nitrate and sodium carbonate, this will need two of these. This forms silver carbonate, which should be a precipitate, and two sodium nitrates. All right, so this is just precipitation. If we want to precipitate more, we typically add more precipitating agent. That would be sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate. So we increase the sodium carbonate, we get more silver carbonate. And then to shift it back the other way, uh, how could we do that? Yeah, we're going to add acid, which will destroy the carbonate, and then shift it backwards. So The acid here, um, we add two H pluses, so that's going to form H2O, CO2. This is not balanced with the sodiums, actually. We'll just add in the sodiums here and balance it. And uh, we should be able to dissolve the precipitate you know, in acid. No problem. Okay, what's next? Watch out for the silver nitrate, because silver nitrate... You know, it, stains. it stains. Do you know what the, the black stains are? No, no, silver metal, tiny particles of silver metal are precipitated because silver ions are not only a good metathesis agent, that is a good precipitating agent, they're, they're also a good oxidizer. And so they'll start oxidizing whatever you know, tissue they come in contact with. Yeah, pull electrons off that, and precipitate out tiny particles of silver. What's next? Adding hydrochloric acid to what? To this? Okay, after we add the nitric acid, then we could add um, uh, hydrochloric acid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, we're going to precipitate out silver chloride. 
This is a common, this is the test for silver ions and the test for chloride ions. It's a precipitation of silver chloride. How can we reverse this one? Okay. This one can't be reversed over there, but we can, um, we can dissolve the silver chloride by adding ammonia to form the diamine complex. Diamine silver ion. How can this be reversed? Uh, well, are you going to do it? You're going to destroy the ammonia by adding H plus again, right? And so we can increase the ammonia, decrease the ammonia, and shift that backwards. Wait, excuse me, how can you just shift it backwards? Add ammonia and Adam, decrease the ammonia? Yeah, decrease ammonia by reacting it with acid to form ammonium ions, which aren't going to attack as a ligand. This step here is hard to reverse. This one. You know, um, you could decrease the, chlor uh, the chloride concentration. Um, but it's hard to think of how to decrease the chloride concentration. All right, uh, what's next? After silver, you reacidify it. All right, so you're just doing this loop back and forth. Yeah, just watching the change back and forth. Back and forth, okay. Once, once you finally have that, then you do uh, potassium iodide. Potassium iodide? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, to this, right? Uh, and so we add uh, potassium iodide, and we're going to get silver iodide. Silver iodide solid. Are you going to reverse that step? Uh, no, that's mm -hmm. not, it's not a bad, but from, you add the silver iodide when it's in equilibrium. Oh, there is some solid in there? All right, so yeah, no change in appearance. we add ammonia. What the ammonia is going to do is it's going to completely dissolve the silver chloride. Okay. We're going to have no more silver chloride left, and then we add the iodide? Yeah. All right. And so we're going to add the iodide to the solution. Do we reverse this step? Nope. No, this one's going to be hard to reverse also. Well, actually, this is easy to reverse if we just add ammonia. Lots of it. Um, but still, it might be hard. Well, let's, some of these steps aren't, so we are doing this loop. You can try. You can try it, yeah, but it might not work. You know, there's ways that we could adjust the concentration and stuff. But. And then the last one is the heating of the milliliter of one molar chlorine. All right, do we heat that in the um, hot plate? Ring stand. Ring stand? water bath. But we're going to do that on a hot plate, not on a ring stand. So just make a water bath in the hood. And then it's, what is it, cobalt chloride? Yeah. Cobalt 2 chloride? Yes. Yeah. And then heat? Then what's the heat going to do? Change the color. Change the color. Yeah, so it says, so you see it after it's hot, and when, it, when it's cold, it's cold, and then when it's hot, it's cold. Okay. Did they give you an equation for this? Now, what did they say in the discussion about this? Just compare the colors. The cold to the hot. Cobalt chloride. Will the heat break those bonds? No, I mean, the, the bonds are already broken. This is a It's a strong electrolyte, so it's just cobalt-2 ions. 
No, because it speeds up both directions. It speeds up the board. It, it, you know, there's got to be some kind of endothermic reaction versus exothermic reaction. Because when we heat things up, it favors the endothermic reaction. Right? The temperature will shift the, in the equilibrium in the direction that absorbs the heat. Right, right. So if we decrease the temperature, we go to left. Yeah, and so uh, we so need to figure out what the reaction is. Whatever it is, it's endothermic and exothermic. And so they don't tell you what colors do they give you. Compare the colors. Uh, they didn't say anything else. No, there you go. Well, here's the, the special part right here, and here's the actual procedure. All right. Actually, I loaned out my lab manual. But I never got it back. So you, you guys have to tell me what's going on. At this bottom paragraph right here. This is the section on the endothermic reaction. All right, it says the endothermic is delta H is plus 58 kilojoules. Yeah, but what is the equilibrium? That's what I'm asking. And so that's what we should find out. What, what exactly is the equilibrium? Heat 75 milliliters of water to boiling place. Compare the color of the cool cobalt to the hot cobalt. Okay. I guess we're adding water. Well, we know that um, temperature does change the equilibrium constant. Okay. Um, this is why, like something like pH is, is temperature dependent. So this one, uh, we got to figure out what this is. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they tell us. And so there's some kind of equilibrium going on here. Uh, then there's a color change. But anyway, we'll see. You know, heat it, and then decrease the heat. We'll shift it the other way. What's that? No. 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 That's odd. I, yeah, just, uh, I remember. Uh, I don't remember. Does that have to do with the water pH changing because of the heat? No. No, it doesn't change that much. Okay. But anyway, um, well, that's it. There's some endothermic and exothermic thing. And then uh, it would be nice to know. Exactly what happened there. But uh, temperature does impact equilibria. You know, KW is one of them. KW is um, only good at what temperature? The one you memorize. 1.0 times 10 minus 14 is only good at 25 degrees C. What do you think happens to KW if you increase the temperature? Yeah, it's going to get bigger, and that's going to cause the equilibrium to shift right. As the temperature decreases, it should get smaller. And it gets bigger with increasing temperature because we just expect more collisions, you know, higher percentage of collisions to form hydronium and hydroxide. All right, let's move on to the next lab. The next lab is uh, Thursday, and that's going to be what um, salt solutions is yes. that it, and uh, buffers, right? Salt solutions and buffers. Uh, so what is, what's the concentration? Are we looking at 0.100 molar solutions of these? They're all point one. What's the first solution we're looking at?
Just, just uh, spell it out with letters. Then. Have you guys used pH meters? Everybody used a pH meter before? Yes, I did. Yeah, anybody not use a pH meter before? Okay. Oh, we're going to use the lab quest. I'll talk about the pH meter on Thursday. So we just measure the pH of these. It's either going to be acidic, basic, or close to neutral, right? And so let's take a look at some of these solutions and then qualitatively determine the pH and then quantitatively determine the pH. So what's the first solution we're going to measure? Sodium chloride. Well, no. Uh, the first uh, then let's start off with the first one. DI water. Our DI water, um, DI water should be pH what? pH 7, but unfortunately our DI water is going to have a pH less than 7. Not everybody's DI water is like this. Um, but DI water is contaminated with something. Do you know what it's contaminated with? Chloride. No, there's no chloride in DI water. Carbon dioxide. This is how one. Um, because the way our DI works, and this is in chapter, if you want to look at this, this is like in chapter 23 or 24. You know, we have our ion exchange columns. These ion exchange columns, you know, cations pass through, anions pass through, and what happens is all the cations get caught by the resin. And to maintain electrical balance, the resin releases H+. So what happens is this kind of this uh, metathesis, you know, where an ion is going to have a stronger bond and knock the H+ off, which has a weaker bond. And so um, all the cations are replaced by H+, all the anions are replaced by hydroxide. And so we can capture the ions, but what about CO2? Is CO2 going to be captured by an ion exchange column? And the answer is no. No, the way to get rid of CO2 is to heat the water. You can boil the water and then drive off the CO2. It's like if you took a, if you take sparkling water and heat it to boiling, it's not going to be sparkling anymore. And so DI water, this is going to be, in, is CO2 um, contaminated? And what some people do is they bring a straw. If you bring a straw in and then just exhale and blow bubbles in the water, you can watch the pH go down, pH meter. You want to do that. But uh, the pH here is going to be less than uh, 5 because, you know, we know uh, CO2 and water will form a tiny bit of what? H2CO3. Yeah, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid can hydrolyze water and form hydronium, which will lead to a little pH. So the carbonic acid, we'll have a Ka. Does anybody know what the Ka for a carbonic acid is? Form some bicarbonate. We don't have an acid chart here. It has a decent Ka value. It's not terribly small. But, you know, very little form, so we have a very low concentration of this. And the pH, pH is less than 7. Our boiled water will eventually be contaminated with CO2, but if you have some fresh boiled water, then there should be no CO2. You boil out the CO2. Nitrogen gas is neutral. Oxygen gas is neutral. So those don't really change the pH. So boiled water, let's hope that the pH is 7. But of course, um, of course, once you open the cap on the boiled water, what's going to happen with the stopper? CO2 is going to get right back in there, and resaturate it, and contaminate it. And so, uh, don't leave the stopper or the cap off the boiled water for too long. Okay. The next um, solution is what? We got DI. We got boiled water. And we got sodium chloride is next. No, no, we're not, you know, the indicator stuff, we're going to skip that. The indicator. We're not going to do the indicators. We're just going to do the pH meters. 
We don't have enough time for the indicators. So then it's, uh, you're doing the same procedure that you did with the water, but uh, with, with all, all the solutions. So yeah, basically we're just going to measure the pH using pH meter. Very quick. Yeah, you get a, a test tube, a medium-sized test tube, fill it one-third of the way, and then measure the pH. Okay. That's it. Sodium chloride, what's the pH of sodium chloride solution? No. Sodium ions, acidic, basic, or neutral? Chloride ions, acidic, basic, or neutral? So pH 7 is neutral. No. No. I mean, yes and no. I mean, hydronium and chloride, but the hydronium water is just is not formed from sodium ions, hydrolyzing water. What you have to do is you have to form excess, one or the other. You know, in water, you're, you're going to have naturally occurring hydronium and hydroxide uh, that's going to be sustained. Like, for example, here, when people ask, you know, hydronium is a very strong acid, hydroxide is a strong base, so why don't they immediately neutralize each other out? You know, if I have some hydronium and hydroxide that forms, shouldn't they just neutralize each other out and be back to water? They do. They neutralize each other out and they're back to water, but what happens next? That shifted to less enough that shift back right. Right, and there's going to be another collision, and that next collision is going to regenerate this, so it's just a steady concentration of hydronium and hydroxide. I mean, no matter what you do to try to get rid of it, you can't. It, it naturally tries to get rid of itself, but it, you know, it's one of those things where it just keeps reproducing, and you generate a steady state or steady concentration. That's the dynamic equilibrium part of this. And so this, this is going to happen, you know, regardless of if there's sodium ions or chloride ions there, and these don't generate any additional hydronium or hydroxide to change the pH. And so the pH should be 7, they're neutral, they don't hydrolyze water. Oh, right, what's the next solution? Sodium acetate. Sodium acetate. Now, sodium acetate's different, because sodium acetate's going to upset that balance. It's not the sodium ions that are going to, but the acetates. The acetates are basic. basic. And so let's do this first one. I'll do this first one for you. We want to figure out the pH of a sodium acetate solution. It's 0.100 molar. And so what I have is I have 0.100 molar acetate. And so I know acetate's a base. Base is hydrolyzed water to produce... Hydroxide. So I, I um, initially I have 0.100 molar, and I assume that nothing has hydrolyzed yet, and then I let it change. So we'll have minus x molar, plus x molar, plus x molar. Um, qualitatively, the pH we know the pH has got to be greater than seven of the base solution. Uh, let's figure out what that pH is. In equilibrium, I'm going to have 0.100 minus x molar, x molar, and x molar. And so let's figure out what x is. Okay. KB? KB, I don't have KB. I gotta go KW divided by KA for what acid? Okay, fortunately I know that number. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Why gives me 5.5 10 to the minus 10, is that right? That's what we got yesterday. All right. This is going to equal x squared divided by 0.100 minus x. I use the simplifying assumption here. And then I get x is equal to what?
What did you get? Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I messed it up. I didn't put my mind on it. But, uh, 7.45 times 10 to the negative 6? Yes. All right. So the simplifying assumption is fine. Um, you have 10 to the minus 3% change. Um, so no problem using that. Is that right? Yes, so. It's pretty small, isn't it? And so this is going to be 0. 0.100 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 7, 4, 5. That's more zeros here. 0. 0.09999664. Wait, no. 2. 255. Five. Seven point four five times ten to the minus six more. Seven point four five times ten to the minus six more. All right, what should we do next? We're interested in pH. So yeah, we look for all hydroxide. And so there's one more hydroxide donor. What, what would that be? H2O. Now, should I worry about H2O or should I ignore it? Well, I look at this number. It's 10 to the minus 6 molar. What's the most hydroxide I'd get from H2O? 10 to the minus 7. 10 to the minus 7. But in reality, it's going to be a lot less. It's more like going to be 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. Would that make an impact on this? No. No. So if I see something like 10 to the minus 6 molar, I probably wouldn't worry about KW. If I see 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 molar, I would worry about KW. Uh-huh. If we worry about KW, then what do we do? Well, if you worry about, let's say we worry about KW, or you don't know. If you don't know, then just go ahead and factor in KW. Then um, what we do is we, we just go to step two, H2O liquid, let's say H2O liquid, um, produce hydronium and hydroxide. Yeah, and then we carry this one down to step two. So this is going to be 7.45 times 10 to the minus 6 molar, 0 molar. That's initial change equilibrium. So plus x, plus x, and x, 7.45 plus x. Molar. Oh, times 10 to the minus 6. This is equal to kW. So this is going to be x times 7.45 times 10 to the minus 6 plus x equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Oh, let's try the simplifying assumption. It might not work. But, uh, let's try it. We're going to get x times 7.45 times 10 to the minus 6 is equal to this. That means x is equal to what? One times ten minus. Eight. Give me more sig figs. One. One point zero. One point zero zero times ten to the minus eight. All right. Um, so then we look. Uh, what was the percent change? So it's ten to the minus eight divided by ten to the minus six, roughly, okay. times a hundred. About uh, one less than one percent change, right? So, so this is less than one percent. Hi Kelly. Okay, so um, just as a reminder, just really quickly, this week we're only reviewing chapter 16. 
next week I'll post chapter 17's worksheet on Piazza so you can download it. But um, I'm kind of done with that, so I'm just going to start bringing the packets and just giving them to every single person in here. So when you come to the workshop, you don't have to ask me, do you have any more left? So that way, you come to the workshop and you already have a worksheet, okay? Okay. Yes? No, we don't have workshops on Wednesday. I don't think Wednesday workshops are going to happen, ever, yeah. But I do have one question for you. Did you guys cover um, hydrolysis? Hydrolysis? Right? Yeah. Of ions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we did. And actually, we're doing now, too. OK. So then uh, we'll go ahead and if you come to the workshop today, we're going to cover hydrolysis. It doesn't take that long. It's very quick. And then um, for the rest of the session, we'll do like practice problems, and we'll have questions open. And Thursday, we'll just review as well. OK? Yeah, they're going to do some practice for the hydrolysis. Cool. So if you guys don't get hydrolysis, I'm going to cover that in the workshop today. Okay. See you guys later. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thanks. All right. Um, so the, what do we have here? We're going to have 1.00 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. Over here, we have um, 0.12345745, 0.745. Uh, plus, we need seven zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a one zero. And so did it really add significantly here? And so I have five zeros, a seven, four, six. So I went from seven, four, five to seven, four, six. Uh-huh. This would be it. Um, well, this is something we have to check for too, because uh, one thing is, you know, I forgot to double check these concentrations. Are these concentrations okay for the double check? Sometimes what freaks me out is that my concentrations they don't need to okay at the end. That's a problem. But it shouldn't freak you out because it, it's kind of good. It tells you that you need to go back through it and see where you, you might have made a mistake. At first I tried the, on a test, at first I tried the quadratic formula, it, it gave me matching numbers. So, so when I looked at the test, I get a reset. Yeah. Well, this double checking doesn't guarantee you it's right. If you double check it and the K comes out right, then it's good for how you have it set up. But if you have the initial ice table set up wrong, then it's still wrong, you know, even though the K is right. Uh, does this double check out? Yeah, okay, we're good then. That's good. And so the, the thing we gotta ask is, did step two perturb step one? So if you went from 745 to 746, is that a significant change or not that significant? No, 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 it's not that significant. So this one won't perturb the previous one. And did we really have to do this? Because is that really going to change the pH? You know, um, calculate the pOH with 745 and calculate the pOH with 746. And did you really make any uh, yeah, difference? It doesn't make any difference. And so in this case, you know, with a molarity of 10 to the minus 6 molar, I wouldn't have bothered with step. Probably when this gets to 10 to the minus 7 molar, I would start to worry. 10 to the minus 8 molar, 10 to the minus 9, for sure. You're going to have to worry about KW being a significant contributor. But in this case, no. All right, then the, the next question to ask is, are we done with the equilibrium? Because don't we, didn't we just form acetic acid here? And so shouldn't we do the Ka for acetic acid, generate some hydronium, and cancel the hydroxide, some of that hydroxide out with hydronium? No, and the reason we don't worry about the Ka for acetic acid is because it's redundant, it's redundant. right? I mean, this is the exact same equilibrium except with uh, hydroxide instead of hydronium, and so we don't do that. Uh, this is already describing this, and the same thing here. Uh, do we worry? In this case, um, you know, this Kw is interesting because we can calculate the pH directly right here because that's our hydronium, or we can calculate it from determining the pOH and then subtracting that from 14, right? 
but let's go ahead and, and calculate it. This one turns out to be quite easy. The pH should be 8.00. The power of the hydronium. How do you know that? Because uh, pH is the hydronium ion uh, concentration. Yeah. And so this, if we're looking at the inventory, which is something you'll have to do for the exam, then we want to know how much acetate we have. This is how much. We also want to know how much sodium we have. It's going to be 0.100 molar sodium, which I skipped that step. But the sodium just didn't disappear. It's still there. And uh, 0.0999255 molar uh, acetate. Acetic acid at 7.45 times 10 to the minus 6. And then hydroxide gets carried all the way down to here. And this hydroxide, you know, this hydroxide is already car count carried over there. We don't want to double count it. Right? It's already accounted for. It's just if we, it's just if we, in case if we worry, then, then we can. Okay, if we didn't do step two, calculate the pOH based on this hydroxide and determine the pH. 8 point what? 8.88. Yeah. 5.12, Yeah. 5.12, 8.88. Wow, we're way off. Yeah. There's got to be some other error. Did, can somebody double check these concentrations here? Oh. And make sure that these double check? Well, uh, over, over here we should get x is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 7.45 times 10 to the minus 6. So I think there is an error in the coefficient there. Right. It should be 1.7. So. No, this gives us 1.34 times 10 to the negative 9? Yeah. Okay which is much less than 1% change. And so let's fix this here. If this is 1.34 times 10 to the negative 9, um, I need to correct these concentrations here. So we're, we're kind of past that error. Yeah, this, there's some kind of error on, on that. And so this is going to be 0 0.50745 plus Eight zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then a one, three, four. That's more zeros there. And so I'm going to point five zeros, seven, four, five, one, three, four. So barely changed, right? Yeah. One from um, seven, seventy-four fifty to seventy-four fifty-one. And then the pH, uh, well, the hydronium is going to be 1.34 times 10 to the minus 9 molar, which gives us a pH of what? So we have two choices. We can just go ahead and calculate. Since we did step two, we can calculate the pH directly, or we can um, calculate it from pOH, either. And so the pH comes out to... Eight point eight seven. Two. Eight point eight seven two. Thanks. Okay. Uh, did we have to do step two? No. I mean, the contribution from water was ten to the minus nine, and so if I had ten to the minus six molar hydroxide here, then the amount I get from water is ten to the minus nine, which is not that, you know, three orders of magnitude smaller. And so maybe we don't worry until 10 to the minus 8, you know? But probably I'd start to worry at 10 to the minus 7. Now, if this were 10 to the minus 5, no way is water going to contribute much, right? This is called the common ion effect. Because if I have a lot, you know, of common ion here, the hydroxide, the hydroxide is not 0 here. If the hydroxide were 0 here, then it would be 10 to the minus 7. But since I have a lot already present, I don't have to generate as much to equal our constant. Okay. What's the next solution? Uh, 
What? Ammonium chloride. Ammonium chloride. 100 molar ammonium chloride. So we have ammonium ions, right? Chloride is neutral. And so do you want us to go through this one together? Yes? I think I already did this one. No? Yes? Huh? We're good? You don't need this one? You're good? All right, I'll... Point 0.100 molar ammonium is going to be the same thing. And probably just step one is enough for pH. In fact, it is the same thing. Um, the <laughs> K value is going to be the same, so let's skip it. it. It'll be the exact same calculation, except for it's for ammonium and hydronium. Let's do some, let's do the next one. What's the next one? Zinc chloride. Zinc chloride. Uh, that reminds me, I forgot to grab the. KA for zinc chloride. All right, chloride we know is neutral, but zinc should be, zinc should be acidic, right. How come? Yes. Because you're supposed to memorize. All cations are acidic except for sodium, potassium, group one, and group two, and calcium, strontium, and barium. Those are the cations of the soluble hydroxides. The cations of the soluble hydroxides are neutral. All the other cations should be acidic. Their aqua complexes will hydrolyze water. What? Any calcium. Yeah. It doesn't matter what is bonded. So uh, something like zinc 2 plus is not in appendix D, unfortunately. And so I have the, the Ka value, but I'm going to bring it. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to find. And what you'll notice on the, when you search some of these, Values. Then you get different values, exactly, for the same thing. Should we use one to the temperature? Or are you trying to find out a 25C? Oh, I'm hoping to find out a 25C. Let me give uh, this one quick search here. We gotta figure out the pH. That's why we're doing the isotopes.
I don't think this is I don't think this is correct. Um, it's way too big. So yeah, let's take a look at um, some K values that are posted here and then see. All right, this is from Yahoo Answers. I don't trust Yahoo Answers. Z2 Plus has a KA of 33.3. Wow. What do you think about that? 33.3. It's huge. Um, that, that means zinc 2 plus is an incredibly strong acid. You know, um, it's stronger than hydrochloric. Well, no, hydrochloric's m way bigger, but still, that means like uh, zinc zinc chloride is is way stronger. At the border between um, weak acids and strong acids, we'd be like phosphoric. Phosphoric is a fairly strong weak acid, right? Wow. And oxalic is fairly strong weak acid. And those are like 10 to the minus, uh-huh. How does a metal make hydronium? How does a metal make hydronium? We'll talk about that in a second. That's why we do this one. But this one is just too high, and that's the best answer. So, unfortunately, I, I actually, I found it out. Uh, right below it, that uh, potassium aluminum, uh, that's the next one that we're going to be doing, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that one's your next one, but that, that one you're going to do on your own. No, I was just looking at the KA values. Yeah, enormous. <laughs> Wait, what are, what are we going to do? Is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 19. Is that a ridiculous number or what? That's 3.3 .3 times 10 to the 19 is the um, aluminum 3 plus, which means aluminum 3 plus must be a. Basin. No, this is a KA. So it must be horrendously acidic. Yeah. Burn holes. Yeah, right. Burn Wait, holes. What happened? Burn this is but Yahoo Answers is like this for science. I mean, I was looking at so much of this stuff is totally unreliable. So what you do is you look for um, things that are reviewed or refereed, and and that's reliable. And so I, I actually found the um, Ka value of zinc two plus in a refereed journal article. What was it? What's that number be? But yeah, yeah, I I have it. I have to um, I have to grab it out, out of my email. It's in my email because I emailed it to myself. But I'll I'll do that in a minute. But how does how does uh, zinc two plus make uh, hydronium? And so that's that's the question. And so what we need to know is when we see Zn two plus like this a cube, then um. It's surrounded by water molecules. It's a hydrated ion. And if the interaction between the ion and water is strong enough, then it can form a coordinate covalent bond or ligand or complex. And so what we need to know is we need to know how many waters can form around zinc. You know, is zinc going to form a tetra aqua complex or maybe a hexa aqua complex? Hmm. Or maybe a di aqua complex? Like silver? You know, and so that that's something that um, you should be able to predict. Wait, is it hydroxide soluble? Tetra. Yeah, tetra aqua zinc. Uh, so, uh, actually, it, uh, tetra is the one I would have gone with because uh, tetra is the most common. But this one wouldn't have it anyway. And I don't know. This is Yahoo Answers, too, so I don't trust Yahoo Answers at all. Me, too. And so you shouldn't use Yahoo Answers as any kind of source for your, um, for your report. Really yeah, they're, they're better sources. And so 
if we have an aqua complex of zinc and we look at the bonding in it, you know, the water is going to be uh, different. This is no longer normal water. The normal water would have a, a delta plus on the hydrogen due to the electronegativity of the oxygen. But now what we have is we have a zinc two plus pulling electron density. And so we have something called the inductive effect. It's going to happen. And so it's going to suck electron density towards the cation here, which is going to increase the size of the delta plus, making the water much more acidic than it normally is. And so this is this is why metal cations are acidic. But not all metal cations, you know, can bond to an aqua ligand. For example, sodium ions, this is just what we call an ion dipole attraction. This interaction's too weak, right? And so it, it, it's not gonna form a coordinate covalent bond, and it, it, we don't form a complex. What we form is a hydrated ion. A hydrated ion, these ion dipole attractions are quite strong. Whereas some, in something like Zn2+, the interaction is much stronger, and we can form this coordinate covalent bond, and we got a ligand, a Lewis acid base type reaction. Uh huh. Uh huh. How come the interaction is strong in zinc and not in sodium? Is it because of the structure? Uh, uh, yeah, it's because of the structure, basically. Well, everything's because of the structure, so that's a convenient answer you could use for most. Uh, for most chemical questions, it's because of the structure. But what exactly uh, about the structure? Well, one of the things we start with is like charge and size. And so, you know, the, the bigger ions, are they on the, um, the bigger cations, are they on the left side of the periodic table or in the middle? The bigger cations. Well, the biggest atoms are on the left side or the right side? So it's the right. The biggest atoms. The biggest atoms are actually on the, the left side, and then they shrink as you go across, right? Because of Z effective. Z effective increases, radius decreases. And so the biggest cations are going to be the group one and some of the group twos. Except magnesium is kind of smaller, and beryllium is a lot smaller. So magnesium and beryllium are going to have much more uh, electrical interaction with the ligands to form these coordinate covalent bonds. And so you're looking at these big ones. For example, um, something like radium, you know, if you're looking at radium, would you think radium would be neutral or would it, would it hydrolyze water? It would probably be neutral because of its size, of the big atom, big ion, right? And so as we go across, the, the cations get smaller and smaller, meaning that electrical interaction gets stronger and stronger. That's why you expect these cations here to be somewhat acidic. And something like iron 3 plus is very small with a very high charge, it's quite acidic. Iron 3 plus is, I think, iron 3 plus is like comparable to phosphoric acid. Right? Really That's acidic. Really well, anyway, um, so zinc can hydrolyze water, right? Wow, um, but it's not the zinc, it's the aqua ligand on zinc that hydrolyzes water. And so basically, uh, a base, a Lewis base, or a Bronsted base is gonna be attracted to this proton. So if another water comes along, water can act as a base, and it's going to see that proton here, and uh, pluck off that proton, leaving these electrons here. So it's gonna convert the aqua ligand into a hydroxyl ligand. Uh, what we end up with is this. And so the net equation, this is going to be the K equation for a zinc. The K equation for zinc is going to look like this. It's going to be uh, tetra aqua Z in 2 plus plus H2O liquid will form hydronium plus now we're going to have a hydroxyl ligand in there and three aqua ligands. So we converted one of the aquas into a hydroxyl. The charge is going to change to this plus one now. This will be the Ka equation. So 
This is the same thing. We figure out what the equilibrium hydronium is, figure out if water is going to add much to it. You know, some of these are uh, polyprotic acids because we got four waters on here. But each successive Ka um, becomes increasingly uh, smaller. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. What, what we're going to do is I'm going to look up the Ka value. I do have it. I just uh, forgot to grab it this morning. But um, I'm going to give you the Ka value for this. But what you're going to do is you're going to calculate the pHs for all these solutions. Okay, and then we're going to measure it in lab on Thursday. Okay, yeah, you're going to do that now. And I'm going to give you some time to do that. And then uh, we also have to talk about buffers, which we'll do uh, either today or tomorrow. Okay, I'll stop here for right now.